Hello, and welcome to another edition of Talking Books with Shauna. Today, I'm going to talk about books uh, in fiction that have to do with gardening or gardeners, because it's starting to feel like it might be gardening weather out there soon, even though I know the rule is that you don't plant anything until after the May long weekend. So I, um, I'm going to start with one that I really enjoyed. Um, and it is called The Garden of Small Beginnings by Abby Waxman. And Abby Waxman is an English writer um, who worked as a copywriter and a uh, creative director in advertising firms before she started writing books and TV shows and screenplays. Uh, and she now lives in Los Angeles, likely because of the screenplays and TV shows. So I've also read one of her other novels, The Bookish Life of Nina Hill, and really enjoyed it. So in this novel, we have the main character, uh, Lillian Gervan, who is a single mom. And uh, she's single because she's uh, widowed. Um, her, her widowhood happened three years in the past when her husband, um, Dan, was killed in a car accident very much um, very close to their home. Hey Brenda, talking about some gardening fiction today. So Lillian has always been close to her sister Rachel, um, but when she uh, sort of went into a, a lot of grief after the death of her husband, um, Rachel stepped in to really support and look after Lillian's two young daughters. So now um, the two girls are seven and five, Annabelle is seven and Claire is five, and Lillian is working as an illustrator for a small textbook publisher called Poplar Press. And she also has um, a dog for the family, a dog is named Frank, and a longtime babysitter, he is named Leah. So. Rachel, her sister, works for an art importer and is still, um, hasn't still settled down with any life partner. So Lily in recently got a project at work to do the illustration job for a book on vegetables by a company called The Bloom Company, which sells seeds and flowers. So one of the corporate owners is running a free garden course on Sundays over the next six weeks at the local botanical gardens. And Lillian's boss wants her to go to make that connection to the customer, but also to get a feel for um, their sort of outlook on gardening so that she can be um, do a better job on the illustrations for the book. So... Uh, children are allowed at this um, uh, event, this six-week event, but Lillian asks Rachel to look after the girls um, even though they are coming along with her. So the two women are going with the two little girls. And the group is a small group. Um, it's consisting of two retired teachers um, named um, Francis and Eloise. A retired banker who's named Jean, and um, a young man who seems really into nature, Mike. Um, there's also another single mom, uh, Angie, who has brought along her five-year-old son, Bash, um, w after the first week. The first week when she saw the other two girls, um, she thought her son would come be um, like to play with them as well. So the teacher is also uh, a young person. Um, a young man who is part of the Dutch family that owns the Bloom Company, and his name is Edward. There's also, he's also got an assistant who helps with a lot of the physical work and the garden preparation, and his name is Bob. And the uh, character Bob, all of the women um, dub as impossibly handsome. So you can see he's kind of this rugged, uh, very manly man kind of thing. So there's a lot of dynamic between the characters, and that really makes up the substance of this book. Um, for instance, one of these situations is when Lillian asks Edward for advice in uh, improving her own garden, and that triggers um, a plot device where the members of this group 
take turns visiting different um, participants' gardens um, to look at uh, what they're doing with their um, spaces. So that's they, they do that after their class um, for the week, and then they do a small project on each garden. So each chapter starts with a little bit of um, very helpful gardening advice, and there's a lot of humor in the plot as well. So it's a real good, no uh, feel-good novel about the power of nature to connect through friendship and to heal as well. So that is The Garden of Small Beginnings by Abby Waxman. The next book I'm going to talk about is a bit of a darker novel, and it is called The Red Garden by Alice Hoffman. And I actually read this book as an audiobook uh, and really enjoyed the, that aspect of it. So Alice Hoffman, you may have heard of before, she's an American writer. She's written more than 30 novels, and I've read quite a few. And they range from historical fiction to contemporary, and they often have a touch of magic or fantasy to them. And this book, The Red Garden, is a series of vignettes set in the small town of Blackwell, Massachusetts. And the time period that these vignettes cover is over 300 years, and it captures a lot of unexpected turns in the history of the town, and it connects those events to our own lives in a really interesting way. So um, the first instance, the, the, t the stories are told here um, in chronological order, which makes it easier to follow. And they start with the um, a bunch of settlers who are very ill-prepared, and they end up getting stuck in um, the location where this town will be uh, during a, a blizzard. And they survive due to the fortitude of one particular woman and um, her descendants make various appearances through later years of the book as well. And there's a lot of wildlife in the book. Um, we see bears, eels, bees, um, among other things. And there are families um, that appear and reappear in the various times that the book takes place. There are also people on the run, including one young man who runs away to New York City with only his dog for company. And there's people that are looking to find something. So from the Civil War to the Vietnam War, the people are touched by the events that are going on in the wider world around them as well. And there is love, there is grief, and there is happiness. There's a visit from a mysterious traveler who comes to town in one year where summer never arrives in uh, this small town. At the center of the town is a uh, the first house that was built in the town, and it is called the Brady House. And behind this house is a garden. And it's a very special garden where only red plants can grow. And at the heart of the garden is love and truth. And in this is a book that really grabs you and keeps you wanting more. Um, because it jumps through the years, you really um, want more of each character. And I would hope at some point she goes back and expands on these people's lives because they're so intriguing and unique. And the stories that they live are very fascinating. Um, as always, her prose is absolutely exquisite. And this is a real interesting view of small town America over a long time period. And it prevent, presents passion and dark secrets, loyalty and redemption, and um, we see how their different choices affect their fate. Um, it's a really unforgettable sort of novel. So that is The Red Garden by Alice Hoffman. The next book is going to take us across the sea over to England, and I'm, I'm going to talk about Consider the Lily by Elizabeth Buchan. So Elizabeth Buchan is a British writer who 
moved often as a child. Every three years, her family would move. Um, and she did spend some time living in Egypt and Nigeria, uh, as well as various places in Britain. And she worked in publishing before she became a writer. And this book, Consider the Lily, is a book about people, about gardening, and about the power of money to influence behavior. So it begins in the summer of 1929 um, with the estate of Hinton Dysart um, getting increased, um, increasingly run down because the family that owns it is going through financial difficulties. They really ha have very little money. And uh, Kit Dysart is the only son in the family. And so he has been told that he is expected to marry a wealthy woman so he can save the family estate. When one of his sisters is getting married, Polly, he meets two young cousins, the lovely Daisy Chudley and her cousin, the orphaned heiress, Mattie or Matilda Verrall. So both women fall heavily for young Kit. But, of course, he is drawn to the more beautiful one, Daisy, uh, until his father talks him into reality and realizes um, that he cannot afford to marry for love. So he marries the heiress instead, Mattie. Um, and it is Mattie who actually triggers the proposal for this, which is kind of an interesting um, uh, plot device. Um, Maddie has a lot of resentment in her too. She, since her parents died, she's been raised by Daisy's family, but not made to feel like part of the family. She's always, um, been feel, feeling to be humiliated, um, about her, because she's not been well a lot of the time, and also because they think she's socially gauche. Um, and so she has already some negative feelings for her cousin, Daisy. Um, this rivalry only makes it that much worse. And even though Kit has married her, so she has won in that, ex in that um, aspect of, of the relationship, um, she's still not happy. She has trouble finding having a child, um, and she begins to put her time into the property. So she redoes the estate and she proves herself to be a very able manager. And then she decides to look at the garden, which has fallen into a, a bad state of neglect. And as she learns more about the garden's history, she discovers her talents in that area. And she learns of the link between the Dysart family history and her own situation. Um, the whole commentary is interspersed with comments on the garden by a sometimes present day narrator, um, Harry, and um, the story is set between the two world wars with strong, strong characters, as I've mentioned, and you can really sense the love of gardening that the author has through the, um, the present day narration uh, um, pieces in it. Um, my copy also had a really good list of discussion questions and an author interview, so this would be a good choice for a book club group as well, because those um, questions have already been developed. So that is Consider the Lily by Elizabeth Buchan. The next book is another British author, and it is The Girls in the Garden by Lisa Jewell. So Lisa Jewell is um, an English writer who worked in the fashion industry and started her first novel on a bet. Um, she's now written 10 novels and she lives in London and a lot of hers are kind of suspense thrillers. And this one has that aspect to it as well. So the novel follows um, 11 year old Pip, a young girl, as she and her older sister Grace and their mother Claire move into a terrace house in a new neighborhood in London. So the family is still sort of recovering from a horrific event in their life where their father, Pip and Grace's father, had a mental breakdown 
and that resulted in him burning down the, the, the house that they lived in at the time. And he is now in the hospital and getting the help that he needs, and they have to start over with nothing. So Pip is very steadfast in missing her father, um, and she can constantly writes him letters about their lives and their new home and keeps him up to date on um, the world that she observes around her. Grace is very angry about the whole situation as well as being scared and she's at the age um, where she is looking for her own identity. She's a tween and their mother, Claire, is very fearful of what lies ahead, um, afraid of what she saw in her husband in his mental breakdown, and she worries about managing everything on her own. So their new home uh, in this terraced house backs onto a large communal park for the people that live in the terraced houses that surround it. So this park is also referred to as a garden, and that is the garden of the um, title. And so the girls soon find their way among the other residents that share access to this communal park. And Grace begins hanging out with five other kids that are around the same age as her. Um, there are three sisters, Catkin, Fern, and Willow, and another girl, Tyler, and a boy, Dylan. So she hangs out a lot at the house of the three sisters because she really likes their parents, Leo and Adele. And they're very kind of hippie-ish parents. Adele homeschools the girls. And as the actions begin, um, the girl's grandfather is also visiting from Africa um, because he has to come for some health reasons. Um, Pip is more of a loner and she doesn't feel comfortable with the other kids. She's a little bit younger than, than most of them um, and she doesn't feel comfortable with her parents. She's an observant girl who kind of sits back and watches. There's something about Leo, the father of the um, three sisters, that really doesn't feel right to Pip and she doesn't trust him for some reason. But she has made friends with uh, another person, an older woman who lives there, who has a pet rabbit. And from this woman, she learns the history of um, a girl whose name is memorialized on a bench in the park, um, Phoebe. And as she watches what's going on, on around her and knows the history of what has happened in this small neighborhood, um, that will be an important part of the story. So there comes a time where there's going to be an annual um, park party and they bring in various entertainments. So there's uh, music, there's face painting, there's a barbecue that's happening. And it also happens to coincide with Grace's 13th birthday. And so Claire um, has let Grace have a little bit more freedom than usual because of it being her birthday. And as the day begins to wind down, Pip goes looking for her sister and she finds her unconscious and um, covered with blood in very discomforting circumstances. So the question of what happened to Grace and who is responsible is the focus of this book. And then we see the interaction between the adults, the teens, and the tweens here, and how the relationships change and develop with the arrival of this new family of Claire, Pip, and um, Grace in their neighborhood. And I really liked uh, how the characters are very individualized, um, and they all have different flaws to them. So that is The Girls in the Garden by Lisa Jewell. The next one is a more of a historical one again, and it is called The Garden of Letters by Alison Richman. And Alison Richman is an American writer um, and of, of historical novels, and she lives in New York City. So this novel, The Garden of Letters, is set in Italy during World War II. And as the book begins in October 1943, there's a young woman who steps off of a boat uh, 
in Portofino, Italy. And she is scared and she's still in shock from some recent experiences that she's had. Um, this woman, Elodie, knows how to disappear in a crowd, but at the moment she is too terrified to try and slip by the German officers with her um, poorly forged identity papers. And while she's sort of standing there frozen, a local man greets her and says, uh, like, greets her like a friend and says, oh, come with me, this is where we're going, and takes her to his house. He is a, a local doctor, and when she asks him why he picked her to save in this situation, he replies that he chooses the person who looks the most afraid. We then um, sort of jump back to see what her life has been like over the past few months before she arrives in Portofino, as the war in Italy has grown more intense. And um, she played a role in the resistance as a volunteer, and she experienced losses of both friends and of family, her father among them. We also see the doctor's story and how he had a great love and was involved in a war himself and experienced great loss as well. And as the two characters gradually get to know each other and learn more about each other, they find comfort from some of their shared experiences. Elodie, um, before all this happened, before the war began, she was a very promising young cellist um, with a photographic memory. And she lived in Verona with her parents. Um, her father was also a musician, and her mother was from Venice and very creative. And she got drawn into the resistance through a good friend of hers, who was a bookseller named Luca, and, as well as some personal experiences that kind of threw her in that direction. And she finds that her unique musical talents and her courage have the power to save lives. So the title, The Garden of Letters, comes from the letters that the doctor wrote years before that have their own strong presence in the story. So this is a story of love, of loss, and of the power of words and music. So that is The Garden of Letters by Alison Richmond. The next one is another historical one, um, and it, it has actually two time periods in it, and it is called The Lavender Garden by Lucinda Wiley, and it was also published in England under the title The Light Behind the Window. So Lis L Lucinda Wiley is an Irish writer who had a very short career as an actress before becoming um, a writer. And she and her family divide their time between uh, the United Kingdom and a farm in West Cork, Ireland, where she does most of her writing. So this novel, The Lavender Garden, has elements of mystery, romance, as well as historical fiction. So it's set mostly in France, and the story jumps back and forth between the present day and World War II. So as the novel begins, 30-year-old um, Emily de la Martiniere um, is dealing with the death of her mother. Um, Emily's father died quite a long time ago, back when she was 14, and she's never had a strong relationship with her mother, who was a fashionable, socially active sort of woman. She is the o now the only surviving member of one of the wealthiest families in France, and Emily never felt like she fit into the life that she was born into. Um, she has instead made a career as a veterinarian, and at first her response is to get rid of both her mother's city home and this chateau that she owns in the countryside. Um, but she also has memories from back when her father was alive of spending time with him at the family chateau and she reconsiders the first impulse that she has. The chateau also has a vineyard and a lot of debt. So 
there's a young Englishman, um, Sebastian Carruthers, who approaches her um, and offers both friendship and assistance, and he's looking for some information as well. At first, she rebuffs young Sebastian, um, but her innate politeness takes over, and she begins to respond to his um, offers of friendship. He does prove to be quite helpful to her, and uh, she begins to consider that there might be a future relationship with this man. So, this woman, she's grown up with all the comforts of life except for um, that of, of true affection. So, she's a little bit vulnerable to that kind of offer. Her father, um, back when he was alive, had shown her affection. But he was usually distracted and he didn't spend a lot of time with her. Um, her mother really showed a lack of concern and that has led to her having a lack of confidence and a lot of self-doubt. And this um, death of her mother and the inheritance of all this stuff has forced her to grow up and to find her own independence and to deal with um, the money that she has, the property that she now owns, and the responsibility she has to the people that get their livelihoods from the um, vineyard at the chateau and stuff. Um, as she begins to look at the chateau, she also looks at her past, and she is interested to find that Sebastian's grandmother, Constance, had a connection to her own father, Edward, during World War II. And Constance was sent by the English government undercover as a um, SOE, Special Operations Executive Agent. But she got separated from her contacts with the resistance and she was essentially alone on her own in this foreign country with no way of getting home and no way of uh, contacting um, the people that she was supposed to be contacting. And so she ended up getting brought into Edward's family um, to some extent and sheltered by them and um, at getting access to um, some situations that were actually helpful to her. Um, as Emily digs deeper into the story, she also finds more that connect her with her own parents and gets more insight into the personalities of the people in her life. And she finds more inner strength um, than she realized that she had. So to me, this novel had the same feel to it as novels of uh, authors like Kate Morton, um, with the blend of history and contemporary um, mystery and romance. And all in all, it was um, quite a good read. So that is The Lavender Garden by Lucinda Riley, also published under the title The Light Behind the Window. Speaking of Kate Morton, um, I'm going to talk about her book, The Forgotten Garden. So Kate Morton is also a best-selling author um, who is uh, uh, Australian by birth and now splits her time between Australia and London. And she has several novels, all that have that sort of contemporary aspect as well as some historical fiction to them. And this book has um, a foundling, it has a, a book, uh, an old book of dark fairy tales, a secret garden, uh, aristocratic family, a love that has been thwarted, and a mystery. So this um, book, um, The Forgotten Garden, is told over the course of a century, from the early 1900s to the 21st century. And it small, follows a small girl named Nell who was found, um, she was left alone on a ship to Australia back in 1913 with only a very small suitcase containing a few clothes and a book of fairy tales. The dark fairy tales, of course. She is, um, because she's alone, she's got no identifying information, um, she's taken in by the dock master at the Australian port where she lands, and she's um, 
brought into his family and raised as his daughter. And it is only on her 21st birthday that, that Nell finds out the truth of how she was found. And she was given the name Nell at that time too. And it's not until much later in her own life that she is given the clues to begin her search for her own past. And as she follows those clues, she makes her way to a manor on the Cornish coast. And she goes back to Australia and then life takes over and her plans change again. And it is only um, after her recent death that her granddaughter that she's been very close to um, now will follow up on that quest for the truth of her past and Nell's origins back in back in Cornwall. So um, Cassandra is um, still mourning the death of her grandmother that she was very close to as the book begins and she is um, wants to fulfill her grandmother's legacy of finding this and the two had run an antique business so there's already a strong interest in the past uh, for both of them as well and as we follow the different stories the stories of Nell and the stories of Cassandra herself we also find the story of an earlier woman Eliza who is born in the late 1800s in a very poor area of London to a young woman that had herself run from her wealthy family for reasons that only gradually um, become evident. So this book, as I said, has mystery, a romance, and a lot of great stories in it. So that is The Forgotten Garden by Kate Morton. Um, the next book I'm going to talk about is a mystery, and it is part of a series. It's called Bindweed by Janice Harrison. And Janice Harrison is a mystery writer who took her career as a florist and a garden shop owner and applied that knowledge to fiction. So there are six books in the series, um, and I have read the sixth one. Um, which uh, was in 2005 that it came out. So Bindweed is, uh, as I said, part of a series, and they all feature the flower shop owner, Bretta Solomon. And they are set in River City, Missouri, um, and billed as gardening mysteries. So here we have um, a young man in this small town, Toby, um, has been born with developmental disabilities and his mother has recently passed away and he's been living on his own since she died. Now before she died she kind of set up a support system within the town for him and um, Toby um, makes his spending money by working for a number of the merchants in the small town that his mother um, set up introductions with before she died. So he does things like sweep sidewalks, wash windows, and other small odd jobs for the merchants in town. But for some reason, even though everyone seems to like him and he's an easygoing kind of guy, someone has taken um, some kind of offense or something against him and Toby is found dead and he has been killed in a particularly nasty way and as Bretta begins to think back on comments that Toby made earlier on the day that he died and other shopkeepers tell her their thoughts and their interactions with Toby over the last um, day or so they um, start to make the connection between the missing plants in his mother's garden that he'd begun to notice and his death. When there's another victim who's killed <coughs> in a particularly nasty case of poisoned bubble bath, um, Bretta begins to worry that there's um, something going on more sinister and she has also received a gift of toiletries to her store and she now suspects that there may be something fishy about those and is reluctant to even try them. Um, 
Meanwhile, back at her house, um, Bretta lives with her father, and they live in a very large house, and they have staff. And her father seems to be all of a sudden pushing a lot for a redesign, a, a, some redecoration within the house, and um, wants to involve a young woman who's proposing the changes, and her name is Abby. And Bretta can't help but wonder what um, the relationship is between her father and this young woman. It seems to be more than just a um, work relationship. But Abby begins to join Bretta in some of her sleuthing. And I really liked um, all the different aspects that were integrated throughout the book on um, information about different plants and other bits of nature. Um, this was a, a, a really interesting mystery series that I hadn't heard of before I read this book. So that is Bindweed by Janice Harrison. The next book I'm going to talk about is um, uh, an American story again, and it is um, The Language of Flowers by Vanessa Diffenbaugh. And Vanessa Diffenbaugh is an American writer from California, and she has also founded a nonprofit organization to assist youth aging out of the foster care system. And that has an aspect that will relate to this book. She lives in Monterey, California. And here, uh, the main character, Victoria Jones, um, was abandoned as an infant and has spent her life um, to date in foster care and group homes. And her last foster care um, home before she became as an adult, when she was um, still not, only nine years old, um, still haunts her. And it is there in that home that she learned the language of flowers. Now that she's reached the age of 18 and she's emancipated, she does not know how to begin life on her own. She hasn't taken advantage of the few um, supports that were offered to her. And she has become homeless. And she plants a small garden in a park where she lives um, in the undergrowth of the park. And um, that talent that she shows in the small garden she creates is recognized by a local florist who begins to offer her work. And as Victoria grows more secure in her skills around flowers and finds herself drawn to the past, to that last foster home that happened so many years ago, she's unsure if she can find peace with what she left behind her. So she has a lot of trouble, as you would expect, trusting other people. And she also has difficulty with relationships. Much of that dating back to all of her experiences, of course. But she's also a woman with um, a well of inner strength and um, a strong belief in herself. She, um, she begins to have a relationship with a young man at the flower market. And so this has aspects of a love story as well as a coming of age story, a story of families, and of course, a story of the language of flowers. Um, I've known for a long time that flowers had meanings um, and I hadn't taken the time to investigate it, but at the back of the book, the author actually gives um, a list of a lot of the flowers that have um, their meanings attached to them and that's a great place to start if you're interested in moving beyond the book on some knowledge around the language of flowers and she was inspired different I was in, inspired to write this novel by her own experiences as a foster mother as well uh, wanting to give some of the um, aspects of that experience to a fiction book so that is The Language of Flowers by Vanessa Diffenbaugh. The next book I'm going to talk about is by a Canadian author, 
and it is called Climbing Patrick's Mountain, uh, and it's by Des Kennedy. So Des Kennedy is a Canadian author, journalist, broadcaster, and environmental activist, and he, he lives on Denham Island in British Columbia, and he's written uh, a book of essays, as well as a memoir, and three novels. So his main character in Climbing Patrick's Mountain is Patrick Gallagher, and Patrick Gallander, Gallagher has made a life in Vancouver, BC, um, hybridizing roses. And he has named the roses that he has um, made uh, after the attributes of beautiful women. Patrick is from County Cork, Ireland originally though, and it is a place that he fled 20 years ago. And you don't really figure out why he left Ireland until you get closer to the end of this book. Um, he has recently found out that his home in Vancouver, where he has his garden, where he works on his roses, is under threat. And he hopes to find a way to save it and to save his roses. And so part of that um, quest to find a way to save that is he's agreed to lead a garden tour um, back to Ireland and he hopes to find a sponsor among the different people who take the garden tour. So he's kind of schmoozing as he does it as well. But his past in Ireland comes back to haunt him in various forms when he arrives back in his birth country. Um, the people that are on the tour are a range of personalities and you also um, throughout the tour get um, introduced to several Irish colloquialisms. There's lots of information in this book on gardens and plants, particularly on roses, as well as on Irish history. And a large part of the story is made up um, around the Irish history aspect of it. Um, Patrick never really dealt with his past and this visit really brings it all back and he must finally deal with that which he ran away from. So that is Climbing Patrick's Mountain by Des Kennedy. The next book I'm going to talk about is another Canadian novel and it is called The Lost Garden by Helen Humphreys. And Helen Humphreys is, as I said, a Canadian author and poet who lives in Kingston, Ontario. She has done a range of novels. This is one of her earlier ones, her third one. And I've read several of her books and I've loved them all. Um, in this book, we have Gwen Davis. So Gwen Davis is a gardener in London. Um, and in 1941, when London has become um, under fire, under bomb. Um, the wild, lovely clutter, as Gwen refers to the city, um, is something that she can no longer deal with, and she flees to the safe haven of the English countryside. Um, she has been watching London crumble under the assault of the German bombs, um, and she just can't handle it. So she accepts a position um, at a requisitioned estate in Devon, England, um, supervising um, land girls as they farm potatoes for the war effort. So Gwen is 35 years old and she's uh, unmarried. She's got a wicked wit and a big fondness for literature. So when she arrives at her post, she finds that the land girls that she's supposed to supervise have very little interest in their jobs in planting. They're a lot more eager to um, cultivate the human crop nearby, which is a regiment of Canadian soldiers that are stationed at the estate awaiting their assignment. So Gwen decides to work with their inclinations and she allies herself with the Canadian's commanding officer and um, strategically gets the girls' cooperation by agreeing to a series of evening dances where they can mix with the soldiers. Um, and in this way, she kind of gains control again of um, the environment that she's been thrust into. While she's doing that, she makes two 
life-changing discoveries. The first of them is the existence of feelings that she's never before allowed herself to experience. So it's kind of an emotional awakening for her. And the second is a hidden, abandoned garden on the estate um, that predates World War I. And she has found the, um, that she has a need to unlock the secrets of this garden. Um, as I said, Helen Humphreys is a wonderful writer and her character, um, Gwen, is both a smart, no-nonsense woman as well as an utterly sympathetic um, character. And as her story unfolds and she delves into the mysteries of gardening, um, you also explore, experience that along with her. So that is The Lost Garden by Helen Humphreys. And the last book I'm going to talk to you about is another mystery um, in the series. It's called Rueful Death by Susan Withig Albert. And uh, Susan Withig Albert is the author or co-author of various biographical, historical fiction, mysteries, as well as some non-fiction. Um, she's now in her 80s and she continues to write having no intentions of retirement at any time soon. So this book, Rueful Death, is actually the fifth book in the series featuring China Bales. And that series now is up to number 27. So if you like it, there's a lot more. So they are set in small town Texas in a town called Pecan Springs. Or Pecan Springs, I guess you would say. And China Bales is a ex-lawyer who has now decided to open her own herbal, herbal shop. And she ventures in later books into a tea shop as well. So various of her friends appear in the novels, but one of them that reappears quite often is Ruby, who is a new age expert in tarot and astrology. Um, Dottie, who's a biology professor, and um, the private investigator Mike McQuaid, who um, see, uh, China has a um, on and off sort of relationship with. So in this book, Rueful Death, China is in desperate need of some downtime. Um, she's feeling under a lot of stress, and she, at the suggestion of a friend, um, goes for a stay in St. Teresa's Monastery, which is on the shores of the Yucca River across the state, in, in, um, still in Texas. And her friend who has suggested this has come along with her, and her friend Maggie is a former nun, which is how she knows about this place, um, because she used to live there. And Maggie now runs a restaurant. So the goal of their visit is a brief, tranquil retreat to um, get them un out of the stress that they're under. But there's a conflict at the convent. Um, there have been sort of two groups that have been merged, and there's some um, uh, uh, ask around that. And um, the mother superior has recently died, which has uh, made some unrest happen. And there's a battle over the future um, that also suggests that her death might not have been accidental after all. Um, there has been a rash of poison pen letters sent to various of the members of the monastery, and there have been some suspicious fires as well. One of the things that is at play is a legacy that has been left to the monastery, um, so that comes into it. And China also encounters there a uh, romantic partner from her past which awakens old feelings. And so now she has to uh, give up that intention of getting rest at the monastery and s instead take on this um, challenging mystery. So that is Rueful Death 
by Susan Ludwig Albert. So I hope you enjoyed this exploration of garden fiction, and I'll be back again next week with another episode of Talking Books with Shauna. Thank you for watching.